So, I'm, good evening, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Uh, thanks especially to the wonderful team that have made the conference uh, work so smoothly. I'm not quite, well, I'm what would be called in Flemish the, the Heckesleuted, the person who closes the gate. So, although I suppose the president will do that afterwards, officially. But the last talk gives me the chance to look uh, at the week to see um, uh, what I've learned. I think I've probably learned as much as anybody here. I've been astonished by the quality of the, the talks. Uh, and my mind is spinning with all the things I've learned. Um, and um, I'm still wondering actually why Eva, who invited me to give this talk, would invite the one person here who knows nothing about typography whatsoever to do this. It's uh, a rather wonderful honor, but uh, I'm not quite sure why I, it's been given to me. Uh, so I'm going to be telling you about a project I'm involved in uh, for Arte, with the uh, cultural television um, broadcaster for Germany and Belgium, who are funding a documentary that I am uh, proposed to them on the history and future of writing. Uh, it's a global project, which makes it quite unique. So we will be looking about at uh, writing in its development all around the world. Uh, you might call the field comparative calligraphy, but um, I'm not an academic, so I'm a calligrapher who rather stumbled into this subject, not by accident, but because for my own calligraphy, I was looking at calligraphy around the world for inspiration. Uh, I looked all across Europe to the different traditions and then started looking to the Middle East at the calligraphy, the wonderful cal calligraphy, then to China and Japan. Uh, uh, all around the world I found things to inspire my own work and I began to ask certain questions about these uh, writing traditions uh, and then I had to turn to experts to help me answer those questions and they will be the ones really that you will see in this documentary. So it will be a three-part series. We will be filming next year, uh, hopefully finishing late in the fall, editing in the fall and broadcasting in 2018. It is meant for global release and we will be looking at the way writing developed wherever it was invented. So from Samaria, Egypt, China and Central America, those are all places where writing had an independent birth as far as we know. Um, and we will see that the steps that, that, that the um, um, peoples followed to, to produce writing were almost exactly the same in all of those different cultures. In the second program, we will be looking at the great calligraphic traditions that developed from these early beginnings. In Chi we will then make a selection of China with Japan, the West, uh, and the Islamic Arabic world. We cannot cover, I of course, in three one-hour programs, the entire history and future of script. It's already boggling my mind to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, so we will be looking at the, c the, the place of writing and calligraphy in these cultures and looking at the culture's history as it was impacted by the kind of writing they chose to develop. Uh, the political development that came from scripts, in fact, you might say. The second program will end at, uh, by looking at the way the, the, these three cultures uh, made the transition to print. It was a different transition, has been, and is a different trans, uh, transmission, uh, sorry, uh, transition in progress, showing that printing history is very strongly influenced by calligraphic history. And I think we've seen that demonstrated in many speeches during the week. In the final program, we will look at the transition to modern digital media. Uh, and with it, the huge political, cultural, uh, and artistic implications that have come from calligraphic cultures that determined certain aspects of the written tradition many centuries before. These developments have implications for everyday life, for typing and texting, translating, talking. Everything we do with letters has, in fact, been part of a tradition going back, of course, many, many thousands of years. Now, I'm saying this to you, something that you all know very well, but remember, what I'm telling you about is a series that we're making for a, let's say, an educated, fairly well-educated general public. Okay, now, we think of script as something deeply rooted and very ancient, a skill that evolved, evolved in some ancient, foggy beginnings of history. Uh, but actually, we know quite a bit more about these origins than you would think. Uh, writing is not something that, as it were, evolved by small increments, um, finally arriving at writing after being nearly writing and almost nearly writing and very almost nearly writing and finally being writing. Uh, it usually um, is invented at a certain point in a small circle of people where a convention or a set of rules can be established, usually at the command of a central authority. Writing was obviously a response to urbanization or more complex and, and voluminous trade. 
and the administration of ex extending empires. Um, and writing, of course, can still be invented today. So uh, I show you here uh, an Inuktitut um, uh, clan in, at the uh, edge of the Arctic Circle. Uh, a script was invented for them by James Evans in 1840. You could mention any number of other scripts invented for non-European peoples uh, in the course of the 19th and 20th century. Naturally, uh, Evans was a missionary, and he had his main goal of producing uh, an Inuktitut Bible and uh, uh, Christianizing the people of the Arctic Circle. This is not so strange in history. Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam all used writing as part of their uh, efforts to spread their message, and with it went the script. And with the exception of Islam, religion made use of print to spread the wor uh, word as well. A case can be made that the Protestant Reformation was the driving force in the spread of printing in Europe. I know there's people who would challenge many of my assumptions, and please do send me those angry emails if I get something wrong. We still have time to correct any of our mistakes before we film and edit. Um, scripts can also disappear. I was just thinking today, I w uh, it would be interesting to do a study to see if there are as many scripts alive now as have disappeared through all the thousands of years of writing history. Hieroglyphs and cuneiform are gone. Sogdian and other Silk Road scripts gone too. Maya, Proto-Aztec also gone. Runes as well, of course, unless you're a Wiccan. Um, but it was never really thought, and this is a very interesting point of our time, that handwriting itself might disappear. But in 2015, the naughty, wicked Finnish Minister of Education removed handwriting from the national curriculum of the schools. They will rue the day. <laughs> uh, and there's cur currently a huge debate in America about doing exactly the same thing. Many schools have done so. Others have already come back to writing after trying the experiment, but on the whole, it does look like handwriting will be simply removed from the alphabetic tradition. So that a new Finnish classroom will, or already does, look like this, and fine motor skills will no longer be taught to small children, at least not through the vehicle of writing. In my view, that they will in a few years have to reverse the policy, but of course by then, there may be nobody who knows how to teach handwriting in Finland. Uh, we will show that new writing technologies can put intense pressure on cultural, intellectual, and social processes. But where the West seems prepared to abandon its handwritten past, other cultures are revitalizing ancient traditions. And here, I do want feedback, please. The Chinese Minister of Education reintroduced mandatory brush writing. Listen to this, I've checked this. Mandatory brush writing into the cu curriculum of lower schools in 2013. We will be interviewing Dr. Jianning Wang, who developed the new curriculum. Um, one thing I should say that this is an Arte program, not BBC, so I'm not going to be a talking head like I am here. There will be interviews, but there's actually a sort of um, contractual limitation to how often I am allowed to appear in the program. I'm not supposed to be this personality presenting the story. So you will see Dr. Wang explaining how she developed a curriculum to teach Chinese children brush writing at an early age. Um, Japanese children still do something called the kakizome at the beginning of the school year in which they express what they want to achieve during the coming year. Uh, and it seems that mandatory writing is still mandatory in lower schools, or at least most of them, in Japan. Now, I've taught calligraphy in Japan, Western calligraphy, and I asked them, why are you studying Western calligraphy with me? And they say, we hated handwriting in school. So they, they're <laughs> often these Japanese kids who had to go to special school on Saturday morning when they wanted to play. Any hands? Is this true? Um, and learn calligraphy. Maybe it was their mother who said, you're going to learn calligraphy. Um, and the trauma seems to have ejected them from the Japanese tradition and into the lap of a Western calligrapher every now and then. Um, now, there are serious advantages to this calligraphic work that uh, Asian children are doing. Studies by French neuroscientists have shown that handwriting your notes as you study uh, creates longer term memories and creates them faster than any keyboard note taking could. And clearly uh, calligraphy has also been uh, proven to, to calm and center folk and give focus to children and I can say that many adults might uh, benefit from that as well. Um, but globally, it would seem that a skill that has uh, a 5,000-year history is poised to undergo another very dramatic period of change, the shift from handwriting to keystroking, 
with handwriting or calligraphy relegated to the world of hobbyists. The West seems prepared to make the, tra the, to make the transition and to abandon the fine motor skill of handwriting. The East would seem to go th be going the other way. Um, and uh, my question is, what are the impl implications of these changes? Who will benefit and who will lose out? Can you break with tradition without paying a price? As we see in Turkey and with the Cultural Revolution in China, uh, the price can be very high indeed. You have to recall that uh, Mao did try at one point to eliminate Chinese characters and replace them with Latin characters, and it was the one great revolution he was not able to push through. Uh, oh, I did get a glass of water, <gasps> and I just spilled it. <laughs> it's not on everything yet. Okay, you, if anybody was in my class earlier in the week, you, you, you saw my capacity for spilling ink, right? Um, so, um, let's see, where were we? Pushing a button, that's where we were, and it works. Okay, the series is going to investigate the entire history of writing in cultures from Europe to the Middle East to China. It's a huge task, but only possible by making some rather dramatic simplifications. But what we can't solve is the mystery of the really earliest origins of writing. I mean, we all have this tendency to look and, uh, at these Lascaux paintings and say, this is where it all started. And we have this mark above the horse on the right, which looks like perhaps a pitchfork or something. But we don't know what that means. We have no idea what, in what way it was used, interpreted, filled with, with meaning by its painters and users. 7,000 years separate this image from true writing. So this kind of theory is, in fact, bullshit. Um, we cannot find the missing link between the earliest figurative cane paintings through the abstracted images on desert rocks to the earliest Chinese logograms. Can't be done. But we can get a hint by looking at um, uh, living cultures that do or did not write in recent times. A Australian aboriginals are an interesting case study because uh, the earliest contacts were recorded um, by European settlers. Uh, the Aboriginal message stick, here's a drawing that I made of one, serve as a sort of memory prodder. This is something that can only be understood and used by the person who's made the message stick and actually filled each of these signs with the meaning that he wants to, the stick to help him remember. So it's like a, so, I mean, you could almost say it's like a quickly drawn set of symbols on a shopping list. Um, and only you will know what they mean. Um, but writing requires more than this. For that, you have to l represent language fully, or as fully as possible, to actually allow another person to read it. And this process was, was perhaps the major step in human history. And the reason is not simply because of this great vaunted thing of writing, but it's because of a process of neur uh, neural borrowing that had to take place to shift memory from the message stick process, from an oral culture, into another set of, of um, intellectual mental processes. We, were we will be um, interviewing uh, neuroscientists to show uh, what I'm talking about here because I don't understand it myself very well. Um, memory can suffer naturally as a result, and it's very interesting if you read classicists um, uh, who have long argued that the Homeric poems of the 11th century BC were first part of an oral tradition and then recorded only about 300 years later. They were first recited and then they were read. Similar stories are told elsewhere, and certainly not least with the Koran, which was uh, a process of memory before the first generation started to die off, and then they decided they needed to write it down. Um, it would seem that the benefits of recording information in writing for use by other people in other places and at other times were worth the sacrifice of living memory. Um, but the big step and the only possible step that makes writing possible um, is the invention of the Rebus Principle, which I think all of you know and have studied and taught your students as well. Uh, we need to be able to take cer a certain number of pictograms and change their function into phonetic markers. So here you see, for example, the Narmer palette, perhaps the first instance we know or the oldest in which this takes place, where the catfish and the, the chisel uh, represent completely sounds, ner and mer, the, the name of the pharaoh, in other words, um, and have no um, uh, semantic meaning from the, the symbolic meaning, sorry, uh, has nothing to do with a catfish or a, a chisel. It's there entirely for the sake of spelling the pharaoh's name. If you don't do that, you can't write. 
And we see the principle at work in Chinese, which has functioned with, without significant alterations for more than 2,000 years in the same manner. The character Ba here, meaning father, so I'm t this is the crossed symbol at the top. You can see it coming from a hand um, on one side. Uh, it's composed, uh, this, uh, the, the character father is composed of a radical indicating meaning and a phonetic element with the sound value Ba. Uh, the, I'm not sure if I really need to explain this to you, but for those of you who don't not quite understand how it works, I will. Our, public, our viewing public will certainly not understand this. The radical comes from a depiction of the human hand since father's work. The original phonetic element underneath is not clear. I did check this with uh, Professor Wong, and she says it seems in some early Han encyclopedias to be described as a snake eating an elephant. I, I have to admit I don't quite see it. Um, but in any case, it delivers the sound value ba. Uh, this, this way we know how to interpret the radical that indicates work, since it appears in any number of other characters. Here we know it must be pronounced ba, and so we read the character as father. Okay, and in Chinese we can then follow, that's the wonderful thing about this, the continuous tradition in China, we can follow it then from the earliest uh, records, the tortoise shells, the carapaces that you see here on the left hand side, through the, the earliest um, um, uh, styles that developed through the square script and on to the fully developed flowing calligraphy on the right hand side. We can see the, the process of abstraction happening uh, from century to century. And this same evolution happens of course in Egypt where papyrus allowed us the, the, the fully fledged hieroglyphics to develop into a cursive version which is uh, called demotic which is in fact a nearly fully phonetic system of writing. Uh, so I in Egypt, we, uh, we s uh, writing seems to start with a series of luggage, uh, not luggage tags, um, um, goods tags, offering tags, um, uh, probably grave goods or temple offerings that have been found um, in certain, uh, uh, you can see, in certain tombs uh, in Abydos. Here we have uh, pictograms, not enough to represent all language, but certainly uh, sufficient to show which clan or village had delivered the goods attached. We see it uh, um, then developing in the same way as China. We can follow this record from the earliest pictograms through the, the development of full writing in hieroglyphs and then the demotic script. And we can see it in Samaria, uh, where the same process begins also, actually. It's the delivery of goods. So in the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent, it seems to have a lot to do with the, the, the moving around of quantities of goods. Um, the oldest form there takes it are clay envelopes with tags inside marking how many sheep or tons of whatever have been delivered and this is marked on the outside as well. So you can actually crack the thing open when it's delivered and see whether anything's been stolen along the way. Uh, now you've all seen these diagrams which show just as in Egypt how the, s the symbols evolve from pictogram to simplified abstract representation which no longer could in any way be recognized as the original duck or ox head or whatever. Um, and uh, to bring this f absolutely fascinating story to the public, we have this wonderful camera su seducing face of Irving Schinkel of the British Museum. And he is an amazing man. He can actually write shopping lists in old Sumerian cuneiform. <laughs> so d you don't have to think of yourselves as really specialists compared to that. Um, now, I, I think I might actually um, we're not perhaps going to be able to fit in the Maya story. Uh, this is something I'm fighting for, but you, you're given about 22 scenes per program, and the, the editor's knife comes down very severely at times. So I'm going to move on past this to show how, or a tiny bit, uh, about how, what we know of the, the origins of the alphabet itself. Um, so the first step of writing was to augment pictograms with phonetic signs based on the rebus principle, as we've seen. This would do for the mother language, but would not necessarily work well if the script was applied to a second language. The nature of Chinese, with its many thousands of homophones, and Egyptian, with its core of three consonants, meant that a character-based script would work well to record the language. Well, uh, but with many, many signs that required a long process of education to learn. 
And this, of course, supports an elite, but not a broadly literate public, at least not in the earliest phase. Owing to recent research, we can now trace the very origin of phonetic write writing, which seems to have happened in the Sinai Peninsula in the early second millennium BC. Why there? Egyptian turquoise and copper mines in the Sinai employed Semitic slave or paid labor. The names of laborers needed to be recorded, and at first hieroglyphs were used for the purpose. But this was awkward, we suppose, for Semitic, for Semitic names, or a Semitic foreman found it difficult or too much work, too much fuss to learn all the hieroglyphs. So our Egyptian foreman or his Semitic assistant made himself an alphabet, and with it he changed the world. I find it fascinating. I, I was just realized this yes, last night that the, the, the actually the story of the handing of the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai is being told at the very place where it seems, according to the evidence, the alphabet actually was invented. Somebody go off and do a PhD on that for me, please. So here you can see um, uh, on this previous the this figure here. Uh, these characters, which have been reduced to pure phonetic signs. The B at the beginning does not particularly remind us of a B, but the L, turn it another way, is still the origin of the letter we use now, and the T, of course, is highly recognizable. Uh, we cannot follow the evolution of every letter from these proto-synatic um, forms to the Latin alphabet, um, but we can see the many have, have uh, uh, had a fairly straight course. Here we see the wu or the yu, the su, the wu, and the he. Um, you'll recognize the wu from Arabic, and you'll recognize the su from Hebrew. But the, the point about the, the, the s sound is actually it's the three strokes that matter. So in Arabic, a flat line with the three strokes will give you the s, and in Hebrew, the, the, the three strokes are, are fit into a sort of triangular shape. Um, and if you uh, turn them the other way, you have the three strokes of the sigma in Greek. And if you add, if you join those first on the left and then on the right, you have the S of, the of our own Latin alphabet. So, and, and from, from, from this place, the, 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 the long journey of the alphabet begins, first to, to all the shores of the Mediterranean. And then I was astonished when I learned that it then extends all the way to the borders of China, where it never crosses and then all the way to, uh, uh, to Southeast Asia via India and Sanskrit. Now, um, my Indian friends here will probably write me furious emails because many Indian scholars claim another, uh, that, Indian, that Sanskrit has its own origins and that, uh, and that and there are other scholars who dispute that. So I'm, I'm not the expert on that subject. Um, but in any case, the phonetic systems all the way to Southeast Asia seem to have their origins in the Middle East. So it's a, it has been a very powerful export for many centuries. It went on up to the, the wild wastes of the Northwood, as uh, the poet Hopkins would say, to Scandinavia even before the arrival of Christianity, but definitely via the Latin and Greek worlds. Um, and by becoming the script of Europe and Christianity, it became the script of Luther and the Reformation, and therefore of Western printing, as we shall sh see shortly. I'm trying to avoid any kind of uh, valuations of this that, that might seem as if there's a chauvinist or primary place of, uh, accorded to the, to the Latin alphabet. Uh, we're simply basically structuring the, the, the programs around the, the existence of a logographic system in the East and phonetic systems in the West and Middle East. Okay, in the Middle East, it branched in, into Nabataean, where it looks not so dissimilar to our own writing. Uh, by that I mean, uh, so, okay, if you look to your right, you'll see in the Nabataean script that the letters are separate units, more or less each time following a similar space. Um, and if you look then to the other side, you'll see what's called Hijazi script, which is considered to be the earliest Quranic script. There are a number of examples of this in existence. And here you already see, uh, probably in the 8th century, early 9th century, the, li the necessary ligature, ligaturing happening of certain letters. And the extension begins even to, to appear here that becomes characteristic of Arabic calligraphy later. This, these ligatures, as all of you know, the mandatory ligatures in Arabic will play an important role in the history of Arabic writing and printing. Um, and then here we have fully developed Arabic calligraphy created ex expressly for the Quran. To my knowledge, the only time a script was developed fully and entirely for one particular text. But I, again, I might be wrong on that. Um, the the sy system of extensions and ligatures here can be seen in both the earliest Kufic script and then in the Tulth script on the left-hand side. 
I probably didn't pronounce that very well. Um, so let me sum up where we are in the man manuscript age. And this does sound like scoreboard of a baseball game, but that really is not the point. It, uh, this comparative calligraphy is meant to bring out certain points in each tradition, and that's something that has interested me for a long time. Um, we have two basic kinds of writing. Logographic, you see at the center. Phonetic, you see um, on the sides. Actually, an alphabet on one side and an abyad on the other side, where the vowels are pointed but not letters. On one side, the, the Latin side, you see individual letter units with no uh, mandatory ligatures. And on the Arabic side, you see extensive ligatures, uh, all of which are dictated by the laws of the writing. So what, par what questions can we ask here? Well, reading processes. Are, are, are all three, or basically both types of writing, read the same way? What brain areas are involved in logographic systems versus alphabetic systems? Another question that interests me is writing speed. Are there speed advantages, advantages to writing in Chinese versus the other two? Does the support on which they, you write, paper or parchment or papyrus or stone or whatever, or clay, does this play a role? What are the advantages and disadvantages of these supports? And finally, printability we will see in the second program. What happens when you make the transition to print? Are there advantages or disadvantages? Now that really is projecting perhaps a Western mentality onto the situation, but we'll try to avoid sounding that way when we get our script worked out. So let's start with the question of how the two types of writing are perceived and interpreted in the brain. I went to a conference in, in, in Denmark uh, couple of years ago in which a team of uh, French uh, researchers showed what uh, they had discovered. And then we've contacted uh, a, a, a professor at the University College of London called uh, Tai Tuomi, who has done research using uh, Japanese subjects to investigate brain activity. So basically she's done this because uh, Japanese uses both. It uses the logograms and it uses the hiragana, as we saw earlier today. And it's, it's um, clear to the scientists, and I have to believe them, that uh, uh, phonetic readers, phonetic activity fires the Broca's area at the front of the brain much more powerfully, with very little at the ventral occipital temporal cortex. I, s I said that right. I've been working on that for a long time. And, uh, uh, and in, in, in re uh, readers of Chinese, both areas will fire at the same time. So clearly, the, the visual or image component of Chinese writing requires uh, a, a, separate se a separate area of the brain to be engaged, which we Latin readers do not seem to have to use or use much less. So here you see it in, the, um, um, in an example of Japanese. In Japanese readers, basically they can wire their heads and they can see which brain parts are firing when they're reading kanji and which brain parts are firing when they read the hiragana. And so it's been able to be proved, at least to the satisfaction of the French researchers. Now, the second thing that is, of course, is uh, um, of essence, or the second question that I asked, uh, is what about the surface that you, that you are writing on? What, what, what will this do for your writing production and actually to the kinds of letters you might write on it? Um, and I could spend hours talking about that, but I'm just going to tell you one anecdote, uh, and that is that um, when I went to Samarkand a couple of years ago, uh, I visited a UNESCO project to reconstruct a uh, paper mill as it would have been functioning in, uh, in the Silk, Ro uh, Silk Road for the last 1,200, 1,300 years in which mulberry bark, okay, mulberry bark, trees make the leaves, silkworms, Silk Road, they've got a lot of mulberry trees along the Silk Road. Um, mulberry bark is used, made into paper in the easiest possible process. It's really no work at all. And uh, of course, this is a process taken from China at, uh, by the Arab forces who beat a Chinese army near Samarkand in the 8th century. And paper was available, easily available. And now what the, the, the thing that struck me was in the hotel, on the sideboard, there's a beautiful, beautiful manuscript. This is the breakfast room of a pretty cheap hotel. And there's a manuscript there. Well, of course, you know, I'm trying, I'm going, can I buy the manuscript? Uh, no, 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 but, but they're not so special. What? My grandmother has a lot of those. What? And then it dawned on me, because when I went to the market there, I bought a little Koran for $20. 
and I bought another one slightly better, but just a more nicer uh, binding for a few more dollars than that, and another one quite big with mathematical texts for about $50. And because I, I was actually not legally allowed to do that, I smuggled them out of the country and survived that process. Uh, but the point is this. You cannot go to the flea market in Paris and buy a manuscript. Impossible. So, well, a real manuscript of the Koran or of the Bible is going to cost, well, I, I think a, a book of ours will cost you about $20,000 these days. So, a simple one. The point being paper. What it, what it meant to have this easily available surface on which to write. And so the Chinese and the Arabs had a writing material that allowed an immense production of books and documents and other written artifacts. It also allowed printing from wooden blocks at great speed, as we will see later. So here's the little, bi the little Quran I, I bought in the market of uh, uh, Bokhara. And this meant that in the Islamic world, straddling the Silk Road, um, all the way from the border of China to Timbuktu under the Sar Sahara, books were in great abundance. And here you see a fragment of uh, a small part of one of the libraries in Timbuktu, which did not all succumb, luck luckily, to the terror. Uh, there's a project to restore the damage that's been done. The libraries mostly seem to have come through it all right. Uh, so that a medieval Islamic library, consisting entirely of manuscripts, would have been many times the size of its European counterpart, right up to the 16th or even 17th century. Uh, so parchment did have advantages. Let's, let's go ahead and say something good about that. Uh, I suppose it's strong. It's eternal if you keep it dry and don't let the mice get to it. But the mathematics of a parchment book are brutal. Basically, in a world in which you had to have that many cows to make a book, there will not be very many books, and their value will be very high. So books in medieval Europe, or in, the, let's say, the manuscript age in Europe, were all but inaccessible to the wide population. I know there's this theory that it was the wicked Catholic Church that kept knowledge out of the hands of the people. But let's be honest here. There was, e with the best will in the world, there would have been no way in a parchment culture to educate the population. Simply impossible. The Roman Forum in the second century, you could go, you could buy a novel. You could buy a printed cookbook in China in the 10th century. And you could buy Greek mathematics translated into Arabic in Samarkand in the 12th century. And these were affordable things. None of this was possible to Western European culture at the same time. And with that, the first program ends. <laughs> so uh, I was given 45 minutes, by the way. I hope I'm going to still get it. Um, the second program will show the development of the great calligraphic traditions in the three cultures that we're looking at. Um, we will examine why China uh, was impervious to the alphabet and maintained its logographic calligraphy until the present day, yielding an artistic heritage of incomparable beauty. So this is going to be the eye candy part of the series. We will just show absolutely gorgeous works of calligraphy and explain them a little bit as well. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples of a, of a truly marvelous running style of Ming calligraphy and how this, this tradition, this great artistic tradition in China and Japan has continued absolutely to the present day. So I'm going to just show you a rather ent entertaining little um, video from the Magnificent Butcher. Let's hope this does turn on automatically. I hope, I I hope you don't know this yet, but it, it, it just ask yourself if, if Western calligraphy could be used as a metaphor in this way. We don't have the sound, so uh, is there any way of having it? Hi,
simply wonderful. So, um, and uh, the strength of the tradition is, uh, is witnessed by the huge exhibitions of contemporary calligraphy that uh, are put on all over uh, Japan and uh, I'm assuming more and more in China now as well. This is, this is an exhibition with the works of just one school of calligraphy in Tokyo, which I attended a few years ago. There were 5,000 works on exhibition. Uh, yeah, I didn't look at them all. Um, um, and the central place of calligraphy has allowed modern artists such as Zhu Bing, somebody else, I think it was Tom that mentioned him earlier in the week, uh, to use writing as a central metaphor in their work. This is Zhu Bing's marvelous Book of the Sky in which he creates his own set of Chinese characters which uh, mean something only to him. We'll show uh, the glories of Western calligraphy as well. Um, some lip-smacking images of the Lindisfarne Gospels in the British Library, uh, which I might call lettering rather than calligraphy uh, in your sense, right, David? Um, uh, I prefer actually even here the term text art because what's really happening is that the, there's, this is not just being decorated, the language is being elevated and interpreted at a different level so that the meaning of this page can only really be represented this way. Uh, in, uh, we will show the medieval world of book production uh, because I want to show off a little bit of what was produced in the place I live, which is Bruges in Belgium. Here is a manuscript produced for the Duke of Burgundy. And we'll show the work of the writing masters, known uh, to all of you here, but not so familiar, I think, to a wider public. And then we will uh, skip on to show what has happened to this tradition of writing in modern times with, the, with development of uh, uh, typographic art forms, such as you see here. Uh, and sadly, we can only scratch the surface of this wonderful material. But uh, I would like to say, just for the sake of, because I'm a Western calligrapher, was that my glasses? Or did I just, no, I've got them on. Um, uh, 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 that's why they're not going to really make me the talking head. Uh, so so they, uh, that, that the, the, the n late 19th and 20th century re really saw the production of some, uh, the, the, the creation of a new artistic genre in the West, text art would be the best name for it, um, which finally gives us the chance to use language in its visualization in forms that are, to my view, as powerful as that of China and Islam. Uh, so that I dare to put a work of uh, uh, Sai Twombly, perhaps, next to a painting by the Japanese artist Sotatsu. And I dare to look at the works of um, Bruce Nauman as a form, not of calligraphy, but certainly a form of language vis visualization that we can compare then with the calligraphy of China or Islam. And I'm going to even perhaps put one of my own things in there. This is a, 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 a very large painting called Pain Paint. Uh, and it shows that a calligrapher, perhaps more easily than a typographer, can address complex issues of meaning in a very efficient way. Here, the word pain balances precariously on a tilting letter T. Together, of course, they make the word paint, summing up, almost in a, in a humorous way, in one gesture, the romantic myth of the suffering artist. Unless you're French, then it says bread. <laughs> um, uh, okay, we're d we're, I, I'm going to have to watch my time here. We will look at graffiti. Sadly, not as much as I would like to because it's, it's one of the unsung heroes here and could also be looked at in terms of, you did a bit, uh, uh, you know, the left-leaning aspect of so much tagging and graf graffiti, giving it a certain power of being pulled across the surface. But of course, it also has its rebellious uh, countercultural and political side, which is of great interest. The, we will then turn to the, the glories of Islamic calligraphy known to all of you, and uh, certainly strong enough to dazzle our public, I believe. And we'll look at the way the traditions have been preserved in the Islamic world. This is in Samarkand again. Um, you may think this is old, but you'd be wrong. Uh, I met the calligrapher who designed this. So that in, uh, in, in huge contrast to conservation methods in Europe, uh, if an, uh, an ancient monument in Uzbekistan requires restoration. They don't necessarily simply copy what was there before. They produce a new work of art that fits the context and is done in the same traditional way. So this is a new calligraphic text um, that has been written by a calligrapher and then carried out in mosaic. But there, of course, is also a great um, uh, tradition or movement of, of powerful art being created with the Arabic or the Farsi alphabet. Here we see 
uh, f one of the photographs so well known by Shirin Nishat, who asks certain questions about the subjugation or otherwise of women uh, in the Islamic Re Revolution in Iran. The, my, my only sadness here is that she's written on the photograph rather than on the feet th themselves. I, I've uh, it's, it's powerful in its way, but I think it'd be even more stronger if she'd uh, done this on the body. And then we'll see other artists who use calligraphy for new purposes, innovating with new calligraphic styles and applying them with new technologies. We'll look at uh, the, the Arabic graffiti world. I'm particularly fond of El Cid, who is a master of line and composition, and also who has developed into a conceptual artist in his own light. Pretty good, eh? Uh, in Cairo, he managed to cover certain sections of an entire group of buildings with his dramatic composition. And this is not photoshopped. This is the real thing. Um, so at the end of the second program, we'll do our baseball score again um, and talk about a question I raised earlier, printability. Here, I know you're going to start to get itchy and want to shout something and basically consider me an amateur. Um, venturing into a field where I don't belong. Oh, and I don't, so that's why we have the experts. Um, the simple fact is that the three traditions of writing present, as you know, three very different sets of problems to the would-be printer. The earliest printed matter comes, um, uh, as you know, from Korea and China. Short prayers printed on scrolls of paper to be placed in wooden shrines or stupas. They go back at least at least to the fourth century are this Buddhist, so Buddhism spreading its word by printing. And uh, these have been found in great numbers in the caves of Dunhuang in the western Chinese desert. The Diamond Sutra, the oldest printed book, 868 AD, it's a mere 700 years si or 600 years before Gutenberg. Um, and uh, we will look at the advantages um, and efficiencies of woodblock printing. The speed of inking and printing a single page from a single wooden block is much higher than the presses of Gutenberg and Plantin. But there is this problem. You need an awful lot of wooden blocks. And here you see just a few hundred blocks of the many thousands needed for printing Buddhist texts. And there was the physical matter of printing. Uh, and where the physical matter of printing is so extensive, it is also easy to control. Printing in China did not serve processes of reformation or revolution as it, as it did in Europe. Uh, fair to compare, let's argue. Uh, the investment in wood and carving time meant that blocks were used for generations. Little risk was taken in the publication of new texts. Printing was, in fact, a rather conservative force. Um, but we do have to let another bit of Western pride fall in the documentary. Um, as you know, but the public will not... Uh, even move, movable type was used in China and Korea at least a century before its introduction in the West. There's no firm evidence for a transfer of the technology from China to Europe. Uh, most scholars seem to, to consider Gutenberg's invention separate, a separate phenomenon. But in any case, movable type in China and Korea came up against the huge number of characters and in the, a in the end failed to take precedence over the woodblock printing. So the invention was made and carried out, but woodblock printing proved to suit the language better. Here we see the Jiki, uh, Jikchi, uh, Buddhist texts from, the texts from the Joseon dynasty of Korea, 1377, cast in brass, and taken by the French in the 19th century. They now live in the National Library in Paris, and the Koreans are really trying to get them back, and perhaps they should. Um, the problems raised by the storage of vast amounts of typographic, of logographic type suggested some interesting solutions. Here's a diagram of an early Chinese rotating printing case. But this, you'd have to have several cases rotating to access all 10,000 characters. This is, uh, these are the type printing cases from the Dai Nippon Printing Company Museum in Tokyo. Uh, they were, uh, Americans um, forced their way in. Uh, with great gifts of printing technology um, uh, into Japan in the 1860s. Um, and it is indeed possible to cut the matrices and cast the dies for all 10,000 characters. That's not the problem. The storage and accessing of all the type is the problem. So you need complex charts telling you where everything will be. Type chart. You'd need several of these sheets again. Um, so a Western typesetter could stand in one place and reach everything without moving his feet, while a Japanese or Chinese typesetter would have to wander from corridor to corridor to find exactly the character he needed. Okay, so this is just an, if you want to use movable type, it's an inbuilt issue that you have to deal with in the, uh, the age of lead. 
Uh, when we turn to the Islamic world, the, 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 the parameters that uh, will affect the transition to type are very different indeed. And here I'm on really shaky ground. I can feel it moving under my feet right now. Uh, but we have Thomas Milo, Irving Schick, and J.R. Osborne to help us out. And so I feel rather I can be kind of brave if I've got them in front of me there to protect me. Uh, the Islamic tradition um, holds that the Quran is a revealed text, the direct dictation of God through the intermediary Gabriel into the ear of the prophet Muhammad over a series of uh, uh, years, actually. The myth of origin implies that the text is perfect, without error, and has come down to us in its pristine, final, and flawless form. This despite the presence of acknowledged errors, or puzzles, let's call them, in the text, which are interpreted to be riddles set by God to challenge the reader and keep him alert. Okay, so when you have this view of the text, this, uh, the natural expression of the text would be in calligraphy, and there's always been an idea chafing against other forms of, of, of producing the text uh, of the Quran. Printing was even said to, there, there, are, there are texts from the Ottoman times saying you can't squeeze the name of God under rollers in ink. So this, uh, there was a certain resistance to printing in that way. Um, the glory of Islamic calligraphy was an artistic response to the beauty of the language of the Quran and a fine expression in black or black and red on white of the sacred text. The obligatory ligatures between specific pairs of letters and horizontal extensions of certain letters um, both contribute to the graphic power of the calligraphy. So it's great calligraphy precisely in that way that will make it difficult to print. Here is another example of by the Maghribi artist al Kanduzi that uh, Christian Sarkis showed us earlier in the week, and who is one of my favorite calligraphers of all times. Um, and so when the Venetian printer Gregorio de Gregori made the very first use of movable type for the printing of a Syrian prayer book in 1514, he thought he had overcome these problems. As you see here, the bismillah, that's the top, oh, the, the very top thing, is uh, uh, a woodblock insert, not movable type. And after that, the rest is badly botched attempt to reproduce Arabic script in lead. Even before this, printed books in Hebrew and Latin had reached Istanbul and raised the alarm. A ban on printing was instituted by royal decree in 1485, extending over the entire Ottoman Empire. Many explanations are given for the ban, one being that printing was an unworthy way of recording the, the word of God, another that the armies of professional scribes in Istanbul would be put out of work, some estimate 20,000 scribes working in the city, and another that the authorities feared the sacred text might be tampered with. A final argument would be that printing, in fact, failed to accu accurately represent the Arabic language. So this is a mess. It would be hard, very difficult to read. Uh, the subject is a minefield, and I'm not sure at all how we can present this to the general public in a fair and accurate way, but we will try. Uh, more sophisticated lead technology allowed for the printing of Arabic once the ban was lifted in 1727. Um, the exception remained the Quran, which was not pr printed in the Islamic world until the 19th century. Further innovation in lead technology allowed most problems of ligatures, extensions, and median forms to be solved, but Arab Arabic typography, as you know, chafed at the bit of a Western invention until the digital revolution. So again, we have this, this Western idea that we heard uh, also from, from Tom, that, that this technology, this lead technology, can be applied to all other kinds of writing, and all other kinds of writing said, no, it can't, uh, or not easily. Lead type was invented for the Latin alphabet, and with its very simple vocabulary forms, its small number of characters, and consistently horizontal line of writing, the Latin alphabet remained the easiest thing to print in lead. And there you go. You have your, the results of this process um, in the production of uh, the Gutenberg Bible and the great era of print following. Uh, the real significance of print um, was recognized at once by Martin Luther. I'm going to quote him. Printing is God's ultimate and greatest gift. Indeed, through printing, God wants the whole world to the ends of the earth to know the roots of true, true religion and wants to transmit it in every language. The politics of script, indeed. So the second program ends with the transition to print in Europe, many centuries behind China, and in conditions that would still limit the spread of information. Paper supplies, for example, in the West, continued to be a problem right to the end of the 18th century, 
And the vast increase in production from manuscript to print, in other words, one year the guy's making one Bible a year, he does some technological innovation, and he's making 100 Bibles a year. So he has to grow his client base by that many in a short time, and that just wasn't possible. So this meant that uh, many of the earliest, if not most of the earliest printers actually went bankrupt. And the Antwerp printer Plantin went so far as to gain a monopoly on the supply of paper in order to keep his presses pressing. Okay, that's the second program. Yeah, we're on schedule. Third program will begin with the Ataturk Revolution in Turkey in the 1920s. Um, in 1928, Arabic was replaced by an adapted Latin alphabet for the writing of Turkish. I'm very grateful to Onur for some insights he has given uh, on this transition. We see, it now as a, uh, we see it now as a huge shock to the political and social fabric of the country, but Onur was explaining that, that uh, his studies show that perhaps only 9% of the Turkish popula population was literate at the time, uh, and so it, 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 the transition didn't hit the rest of the society for a generation or so to come. Uh, the shock would really come later when secular Turks and religious Turks would recognize the, the gap that had grown up between them. I do ask myself what would have happened if Arabic script might have been easily printed with lead uh, or with whatever uh, technology at that time. Would Ataturk have abandoned it? According to Onur, Arabic is not a good match. Arabic script is not a good match for the Tur Turkish language. No time to explain that, but I'm sure there is something in the argument. So this is now going to sound chauvinistic, um, but uh, we'll try to pro avoid that pitfall. We'll what we'll attempt to do in the third program is show the accelerating technological developments from in the West from early lead printing to mechanized printing to mass printing to the development of typewriters and other devices for recording and printing language and the advent of computing, the whirlwind of the European 20th century, all of which forms part of the scientific industrial and military developments that propelled the West to all corners of the world and to the carve up of civilizations far older and in many respects far more highly developed than our own. Are we making exaggerated claims for the power of information technology? I don't think so. But again, this is all very sensitive ground. Chinese script doggedly resisted all pressures to succumb to the supposedly su supposed superiority of Latin script. So on the whole, what I heard Tom saying this week actually pretty much accords with the research that we've been doing. Um, there were several efforts in the 20th century to convince the Chinese to abandon their 3,000-year-old their tradition of writing. Some of these efforts came from Chinese quarters themselves, but all failed, and thank goodness for that. Chairman Mao himself proposed abandoning Chinese characters in favor of pinyin. Though he managed to push through measures that cost millions of lives, this was a bridge too far and was never accepted. Some wish he had succeeded, even now, but most Chinese realized that, realize that they must hold on to one of their most valuable cultural assets, their writing. Mao did manage to simplify the most frequently used characters, again to much protest even to this day, and creating a split, a linguistic split with Taiwan, which still uses unreformed characters. So you can immediately see a Taiwanese text or Chinese text just because one uses reformed and the other doesn't. Here you can see four characters which were dramatic, drastically, or uh, in the last case, not so drastically simplified. Uh, as we heard yesterday, the West attempted to export its keyboard technology as well to the non-Latin world. Uh, I now know to use such a term with great caution. The Latin keyboard was relatively easy fit for Arabic, but prevented, uh, presented insurmountable in... Mm. Did I spill all the water? No. Insurmountable difficulties for Chinese. And then came the level playing field. The digital revolution has not only swept away the so-called disadvantages of Arabic ligatures and the vast numbers of Chinese characters, it has brought certain advantages of these ancient but typographically challenging scripts to the front. Let's look at a typical YouTube, okay, these are really rather funny, just a YouTube vi video showing um, pinyin being used to input Chinese. Let's hope this goes automatically. I like the music. Google 
中文滑行输入体验，你可以一次输入一个字、词、短语或者句子，同时上滑下滑，快速输入英文单词或标点符号，无需切换。Okay, and now we'll see the stylus. Okay, so.、Uh, In as much as I can、uh, follow the, the the developments happening in in, in the world of、um, texting, typing, and all the rest in the Chinese and Japanese world, it seems like it's an amalgam of different processes going on. And、uh, according to Tom, something that I've already seen confirmed elsewhere, it's actually possible now using character recognition in the tip of your finger or a stylus to actually input. A great deal faster than with Latin letters. So all of a sudden, a technology that came from the West was exported to the rest of the world is proving to be even more advantageous to other cultures than to our own.、Um, we'll look at the great contribution to the typographic that the typographic community has made to creating modern and highly functional fonts for all, or at least most, of the world's script. For Arabic, a secular space has been created with fonts that do not resemble Quranic script. I particularly applaud the CAT typographic matchmaking, matchmaking initiative, which we heard about earlier this week. And I want to say that Christian and your team just stunning work that、uh, that you were doing, marvelous things.、Uh, and of course, young people have tailored the technologies to their own needs at every stage. You ask me how I know. I have a 19-year-old daughter who gently explains to her aging father what is going on out there. Here is an example of texting in Arabic using Latin script with numbers to represent letters not found in the Latin alphabet, and a fusion of languages that represents the texter as fully in the loop and not bound by the limitations his script once imposed on culture. Indeed, there will be many more limit.、Uh, well, hold on. Indeed, will there be any more limitations of language and script in the future? Will we bother to learn languages, or simply use ev ever more sophisticated translation software? Nuance Communications promises headphone translation in the near future. We'll simply put on a headphone and speak to each other, and have the translation、uh, automatic for automatically from every language in the circle of people. So why would you bother learning French or German or anything else?、Um, the printing press favored the Latin alphabet, but digital technology does not. The level playing field has been achieved. Now it must be made playable, and that is a political question. Scripts will still carry important cultural messages; will still serve as logos of their various cultures. I've recently been in Kazakhstan, which has adapt,、uh, adopted a plan to change from Cyrillic to Latin by 2020. They have to, they have to delay their plans at the moment as political tensions in the region in the region have risen sharply in the Putin era. We have been given access to this story and hope to present it in an attempt, in an, as an example of the political issues that have accompanied script and print for centuries. Kazakh.、Uh, let's see. I'm going to have to move along here. Yes. Oh, I think it's important to say Kazakhstan is at the northeastern arc of the long Turkic crescent that begins in Istanbul. Nearly a century ago, Ataturk abandoned Arabic script in favor of Latin, in order to promote the modernization of his country, and the education of his people. Uzbekistan did the same shortly after independence from the Soviet Union, and now Kazakhstan follows, the last of the Turkic nations to do so. So you see this Latinization of all of Central Asia. Script remains not only a means of communication, but a badge of identity and a political tool. In the news, we see a、uh, we see a script, and we know where we are. Have some idea of the political issues being represented or misrepresented. Writing will be used by artists for protests. In ways very similar to the use of print in the Protestant Reformation as a weapon against the power and corruption of the Catholic Church, the program will end with a plea for script as a unifying force, a force for peace and mutual understanding. The red thread of the series. Okay, I can explain this without looking at that.、Um, basically, when you see me in the program, I'm going to be interviewing calligraphers from all over the place and talking to them about their traditions, about 
uh, how uh, the um, digital age is impacting on their traditions and where they think the traditions will go in the future. And then I'm going to invite them all to come back to an event that we will um, organize in a, in a place we don't know yet. We're, perhaps it's the, the Bibliothèque Mazarin in Paris. It might also be the, uh, the ancient Roman archive at the Forum in Rome. But in any case, what we'll do is we will um, have a, uh, a large darkened space and calligraphers from 15 different cultures, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Tibetan, Hebrew, Greek, you name it, Hindu, Urdu, it's all sitting in the space and writing in complete silence. We've done this now already. It's called a brush with silence, and I've done this already in uh, Germany a couple of times and in Belgium, uh, Belgium a couple of times. The public is allowed to go through, but they must stay silent too. All they see, 15 people writing in 15 different scripts brushes, pens, and so on. Um, and the public is immensely moved by this. Uh, and it's, and it, uh, is, is quite, quite a, a wonderful statement of how, at, at the level of c deep culture, we really can all coexist uh, in this world of ours. So we hope that uh, the pen in the end will prove to be mightier than the sword. Um, now, just to end all of this, um, you are typographers. You have immense powers, really, and responsibilities, as you know. Centuries of calligraphers have created the letter forms that you use every day. Our typographic godchildren have been sent into the world to bring us together. So convergence is our only hope. Thank you. <laughs>